It is Friday, September 21st. Let's talk PlayStation. Okay, a very interesting news week for the world of PlayStation, and we're going to go right into our first big news story. If you remember, a few months ago, we actually ran a news story about how one Reddit user had noticed on their PlayStation Now interface that they had a download option for the games, and uh, when they tried to click it, nothing happened, uh, or it errored out, and then early rumors kind of suggested that Sony might be working on this and releasing it around September. Well, sure enough, it's September, and Sony has officially announced it. Downloading your games is coming to PlayStation Now. So let's dive into the minutiae of it. Here are the details. Now, unfortunately, I know a lot of people are thinking about this right away. It does not cover PlayStation 3 games, and we all know why. I've explained this in uh, a few videos and one recent video I did last month, but PS4 cannot play PS3 games. It does not have a cell processor. It does not emulate the games, and it's very likely that it may never be able to do that because it's just uh, somewhat impossible. So unfortunately, it does not download PlayStation 3 games, but you will be able to download most PlayStation 4 games on the service and to select a few titles uh, from the PS2 catalog on there. Now, they're rolling it out currently to a few users. They're saying over the next few days that it should be available for everybody. So I'd have to imagine it wouldn't take longer than a week for it to be widely available for everybody or new subscribers to the service, which is pretty cool. Uh, you don't need PlayStation Plus to, say, play a game online. So that's actually a pretty good bonus. Um, however, you do need PlayStation Plus if, for example, you're a current subscriber and you have a save file with the streaming version of the game, then you download the game, you'd have to use PlayStation Now to, tr to cloud save, transfer your, your save file to the downloaded version, which seems a little weird and wonky, but you do need to be a Plus subscriber if you want to do a, if you're in that kind of particular situation. Um, now the other unfortunate thing, but it's understandable and some people are complaining about this, but like, you gotta see where they're coming from. You do have to check in online after a few days, um, so basically a, you know, it's it's required at some point that uh, after you're playing these games offline for a certain period of time, they will stop working if you don't connect back to the internet. Uh, I get that people are kind of referencing back to Microsoft 2013 or, or Nintendo's recent online service, but like, you gotta understand, like, what if somebody buys one month of PlayStation Now and then downloads all the PS4 games and then never, never signs back in and just wants to, you know what I mean, that's abusing the system. They unfortunately have to require something like that. Now, um, this is interesting. This is kind of a, I would go as far to say that this is a game changer for a number of reasons. And I think the big thing is, um, for example, Xbox Game Pass, which is Microsoft's kind of um, download service for Xbox One games and Xbox 360 games. You, you know, for a certain amount of money every month or every year, it's about $120. You get access to over 100 games that you can download to the system. And uh, people actually really enjoy that because you're downloading the games locally to the hard drive and it's on your terms and, and you don't have to worry about latency or streaming. And, and a lot of people really enjoy that. And everybody have always, every, so many gamers have vehemently hated or, or disregarded PlayStation Now because it's a streaming service and some people don't have that internet connection or they just simply refuse to stream their games. And while I completely sympathize with that sentiment and I'm right there with you, I've tried PlayStation Now, I vouch for it. I've vouched for it a few times. If you don't mind streaming your games, if you have a solid internet connection, $100 a year, $20 a month is not a bad deal for 600 games and a vast array of PS3 games. Now, it's, yeah, the the bulk of the, uh, the library is PS3 games, so it kind of sucks there that... Um, if you're more into the downloading aspect of it, it's reserved to just PS4 games. But assuming that you're playing a lot of PS4 games, this is, this is going to make it a lot more interesting. Now you've got a situation where people will sign up to the service just for the download portion. And I think this is a very critical thing. And it's a very good move for Sony because this may be a sort of, for lack of a better word, a gateway drug into it. If somebody's going into PlayStation now purely for the download aspect, they're certainly going to experiment and at least try the, the, um, the streaming aspect of it. And I think that's the thing. It's a big hurdle for so many people. I don't want to stream my games. But if you offer a service that has both of them, they're going to try streaming at one point just out of pure curiosity, see that it works so well, and they might actually end up sticking with it and actually start streaming more games. I think this is something that Sony probably should have done a long time ago, um, but maybe it just wasn't on the cards at the time, or maybe they've been working up to this, this moment, um, because PlayStation Now... It's, you know, they're adding so many games to it, but they never talk about subscriber numbers. They never talk about revenue because it's probably very, very, very small and they're kind of ashamed of it. This happens a lot with console manufacturers or any tech companies, really. If they don't reveal numbers, it's because they're not very proud of the numbers that they're doing. So I think this is actually a great idea. This is this was something that really needed to happen. And I think uh, I think it's it is it's going to entice a lot of people to probably either stick with the service or see the benefits of streaming.
And this is coming from somebody who always buys physical games. If there's ever a physical version, I will always buy it over digital or streaming. I'm just saying it does work. It's actually a good value. And uh, I think long term, this is what Sony was looking for. So if you didn't notice, two days ago, Sony announced the PlayStation Classic. We did a video on it two days ago. So we actually covered most of the details in a separate video, which I'm sure most of you have probably seen on the channel front already. But of course, real quick, it's just like a uh, an NES Classic, an SNES Classic. It's going to have 20 original PlayStation games on a miniature PlayStation. And um, uh, the one extra tidbit that we got um, just recently is that actually the Japanese version of the PlayStation Classic will have a different, uh, there will be some software different. So there may be one or two titles swapped out of that rotation. Um, there's not really any other details that we've really talked about. This is more of a waiting game at this point until Sony reveals the rest the the rest of um, the games that are going to be available. So because we only know five of them right now, basically. Uh, so we don't know the differences in titles and we don't know those other 15 games. Uh, I guess the only thing I will add to this discussion that I wasn't able to add in that previous video as I'm baffled by the amount of people that saw this and are and are immediately comparing it to backwards compatibility or even PlayStation Vita TV, which I understand PS Vita TV is a great little $100 PlayStation that is playing Vita games, PSP games, you know, PS1 games, uh, PS minis. Like, I understand it's a great platform in that regard. It's just, I... <laughs> How do people not see that this is just like a nostalgia device? This is clearly a novelty device. This, <laughs> the PlayStation Classic is not answering backwards compatibility. It's got 20 games on it. When you really think about it, that's not that much. The system's a little overpriced, not including an AC adapter. I mean, come on, this is just a, this is just a way to, to make a lot of money really quick. They're, they're tugging on the strings of nostalgia. It's a novelty device. It's a collector's device. And also keep in mind, um, you know, you can buy it and just run a bunch of emulators on it. That's what people do with the uh, NES and the SNES. And that's, it's not a bad idea, really. If you, so if you're actually serious about using this thing to play a lot of PS1 games, you can certainly probably go ahead and do that. There's probably going to be a big scene for that well after, like, one or two days after it comes out. Uh, it's just, like, it's this is so clearly not actually an answer to PS1 backwards compatibility or a, it's not a rival to the playstation tv which is a dead system at this point they don't manufacture that anymore oh, i'm just i'm going off on a tangent sometimes man i see these comments online and i'm just like good lord man some gamers are irrational or they just don't see things for the way they are your boy ryan's been going on some rants lately and i don't know if that's a good thing <laughs> Anyway, going into our next news story, if you remember, um, uh, this past April, Sony released God of War on the PlayStation 4, and it turned out to be the fastest-selling PlayStation game in uh, Sony's history at 3.1 million copies sold in the first day, which is pretty awesome. Well, it turns out that's already been beaten by Spider-Man PS4. Spider-Man sold 3.3 million copies in the first three days of release, which is crazy, and I'm glad that they've done so well because that game really is awesome, and so many people are playing it, and, and it's, you know, it's so many people are playing it that maybe never wanted to play a superhero game or or never cared much for it now you've got a lot of gamers getting interested in the rocksteady games which were which were great batman games um so that it's good to see it's doing so well what i'm wondering is now you've got this weird situation with insomniac and sony because insomniac's a second party developer you know they're they're independent actually and they've gone on record to say a number of times over the years they don't want to get bought and so they probably will stay independent for as long as they exist uh, but they've said they want to pursue their own original IP and things like that, you know, which they've done the last five or six years. But it's not like Sony's going to it's not like Sony's going to be like, OK, thanks for making a great game. See you later. Like there's going to be more. Sony's going to want more out of them. Uh, so what's going to happen from here? Another Spider-Man another just another superhero game in general? I mean, there's so many ways that this can go. It's got a lot of avenues, but you've got a, a situation where Insomniac is now responsible for the fastest selling PlayStation game ever. This isn't going to be the end of it. Sony's going to want more. And, uh, you know, I think as long as Insomniac stays independent and as long as Sony has exclusive rights, I think they're both going to be pretty happy with each other because at the end of the day, they're both going to get paid. Insomniac knocked, out of the, knocked it out of the park, which is... Um, which is great. You know, I, I couldn't be more happy for them. So we haven't talked about a Sony patent in a while. Well, there is a new one. Sony filed this back in 2017, but it was recently published this month. It's for PlayStation VR and motion sickness. And, uh, you know, it it's not really doing anything. So basically what this application says 
and what this patent is suggesting is that uh, a certain technology in PlayStation VR would use thermometers and, and headphones and things like that to kind of understand and sense the user's discomfort. So for example, if they're getting too hot or, or moving excessively or sweating, or if they're even using foul language, which was also said in the patent, the, it would detect the discomfort of the player and potentially alert them, which kind of makes me think, okay, that's not really doing much of much of anything, because that is a big problem with VR, is motion sickness. I still suffer from it, you know, two years onward with PlayStation VR. I can't play it for more than an hour and a half, I'm going to be dead honest, and when, especially when I'm using, like, the PlayStation Move controllers or the AM controller, it's not like it's strenuous activity, but sometimes it's just like, okay, I gotta stop after like an hour, you know? Especially when you do feel a little uneasy doing a first-person perspective or or a racing game, for example. It just, for me, it really messes me up and it messes up a lot of people. It's a huge issue. Um, so initially I thought, okay, it's great that they're trying to find a way on a hardware level to take care of this, but it seems like this isn't really doing anything. It's just telling you if you're upset. I think the person's gonna know if they're upset, especially if they're using foul language, which may or may not even be related to motion sickness. Um, but as it stands right now, all things, all the things that are being done to combat motion sickness is on a game-by-game -game basis at the hands of the developers. A lot of developers are just including specific toggles in their games to help ease motion sickness. So for a lot of first-person games, they're either blacking out the bars around your peripheral vision, or they're using snap angles where you're not actually seeing the, the motion of you moving this way and this way. You're just snapping your entire angle from left and right, and you're dodging the kind of motion of the camera. You know, game, each, you know it's a title-by-title title basis. So this patent strikes me as odd and weird, and I don't know why it's... What are you going to do? you going to tell me I'm feeling like crap? I already know I feel like crap. For our final news story, it's not great news. It's... It's sad news, but we kind of saw this coming. Sony Interactive Entertainment Vice President Hiroyuki Oda was talking to Famitsu and shared the news that PlayStation Vita production is ending in Japan in 2019. That's pretty much it. So, of course, shipments have stopped to most territories, but the system was still being manufactured and, and sold in Japan, for example. Well, that's now that's it. Like, the last update we really got was that there was a deadline for the cartridges, so physical games being manufactured and released and the deadline for that was basically 2019, more or less, but there was still sort of a, a cutoff date around 2018 to, for, for specific submissions of getting your games ready and certified to be printed onto the cartridges. Well, anyway, that was kind of like a, a last-ditch effort, but now we have a solid idea with manufacturing, and it is 2019. Hey, I mean, we've talked about Vita a number of times. There we go. Now we know that, it's a, that that's basically it. Now, here's the interesting quote that Hiroyuki shared in regards to PlayStation Vita, and it's not surprising news, but he, he was quoted as saying, currently we do not have any plans regarding a new handheld device. In Japan, we will manufacture PlayStation Vita until 2019. From there, shipping will end. I have no reason to not believe when he says that. There's a lot of things where Sony might say we're not doing this, or we can't talk about that, or it's not happening, and gamers will often speculate still because, uh, you know, they're not going to tell you directly, oh yeah, we're actually working on another one, or oh yeah, you can expect a sequel to this game or something. They want to save these announcements for trade shows or, or the press releases or whatever. He's telling the truth. They're, they're not making another uh, portable PlayStation, which is a shame. Which, which is a shame. Um, I don't want to talk long about this because we've done so many videos on the Vita and Vita's demise, and I did a 20-minute long documentary about it. You can go watch it, The History of PlayStation Vita. Um... The one thing I will always say is that a lot of people blame Sony for it. I will blame Sony as well for the uh, for the handheld's failure. However, I will always be the first to say I don't think it's necessarily just Sony's fault. There's clear market indication that it's just different nowadays. The Vita just was not going to thrive and live comfortably um, in the age that we live in today. If you look at the 3DS, for example. Yes, it is up to 70 some odd million units worldwide, and that's those are very good numbers. That's not even half the DS. Uh, it's very clear that it's different, and even that recent uh, poll that we talked about a week or a week a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, that's implied that nine percent of gamers nowadays are playing handheld games. I mean, it's just it is what it is, you know. But anyway, I think today's Sony is focused and determined, and they know what consumers want, and they know what's going to keep the business at its most profitable and uh, 
what that is right now is PlayStation 4, traditional console hardware, streaming, making PlayStation uh, a synonymous brand, releasing those big budget games. Uh, that's what's been working for them since the start of the PS4's launch. And uh, it's, it's not going to change. We probably won't ever maybe see a portable PlayStation again. However, I'm always hopeful. Moving on to Let's Talk Plus, our weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway, where I give away a $10 PlayStation Network card to one lucky viewer. I'd like to congratulate Sergio, simply Sergio, from Huntsville, Texas. You are the winner of the $10 PlayStation Network code. I will be contacting you within the next day or so on Twitter or the provided email, and you will have your $10 PlayStation Network code, but you must respond to my message to receive the code. If you would like to win a PlayStation Network code for $10, follow the link down below to the Gleam app, and that will allow you to uh, submit an entry. You've got to be subscribed to the channel, follow on Twitter, or retweet this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. And let's be honest, I think you should. I, I want you to have that $10 code. That's it for the news stories. Now, before you leave, you got to check out this past Tuesday's firmware video. We compared PS4 firmware 6.0, which just came out, to firmware 2.5, which is from March 2015. You'll be really surprised by the results. I totally didn't expect it at all. And once again, uh, we also did the PlayStation Classic video. So if you do want some extra details about the PlayStation Classic or my opinion on Sony's cool little nostalgic platform, check it out as well. Now, the big thing, this Monday... The PS4 documentary will go live. I'm super excited. I can't wait for you guys to see it. Um, I'm genuinely asking you, uh, when you check it out this Monday, give me your sincere, honest opinion. What'd you think of it? A lot of you guys really enjoyed the Vita documentary and thought it was my best video. I think this one's even better. Uh, if you could share it around, share it to your friends, uh, put it on a local Facebook page or something that you've got, you know, help your boy out. It took a long time for me to make that video. I. I think it was it is really good but also let me know and give me some feedback as well but if you could try and share it around and um, get it going a little bit you know and you don't have to but if you want to you can support on patreon we're doing a lot of stuff on patreon now like for example early access to that documentary but also you're getting let's talk playstation as an mp3 every single week for the podcast service of your choice and also more behind the scenes stuff and more personal life stuff if you're into that kind of junk but uh, your support is always appreciated however you definitely don't have to I just appreciate it. But you guys know I always appreciate you, which is why I'm trying to give you $10 PSN codes every single week. What's funny is that last week's entry was the same amount of users as our first week. Literally the same amount. It was 206 the first time, 206 this time. I love you guys, but damn, you're consistent. <laughs> same amount. Let's try and get more, uh, more people in that as well. Anyway, that's it. That concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Vidaki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I'll see you guys next Friday.